एलसिड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स नाम तो सुना ही होगा one of the very newsy stocks of this past year was elsid investments which had shares in dozens of listed companies including asian paint sun pharma reliance industries and others remarkably while the per share value of all these investments was close to 6 and a half lakhs astonishingly the company's shares were being quoted in the stock exchange for just 17 rupees understandably no one was able to buy this stock and that's because no one was willing to sell it at just 17 rupees but this video is more about what else it does and quite simply a holding company is one that holds stocks in other companies this can be a controlling stake like the 50% karma holdings has in srf limited and can also be a minor shareholding in one or several companies like what tata investment corporation has we'll discuss these and a few more in this video as we go deeper into the world of holding companies if it makes sense to invest in them some sensibilities and of course some interesting strategies that you can use let's begin It's not uncommon to see promoters not directly investing in companies but doing that via a holding company. For example, if the Bajaj family wants to indirectly take a stake in Bajaj Auto, then they would prefer investing in Bajaj Holdings and Investment Limited, which makes this entire transaction like a grandparent, parent and child relationship, a bit like this movie poster here, although this particular Bollywood family tree is a bit taller. But you and I at least most of us are neither a bajaj nor a kapoor so why would anyone want to invest in a holding company well firstly investing via a holdco is a pretty reasonable way of getting exposure to a well managed group for instance if you like the bajaj group then instead of going all in with bajaj finance you can invest in bajaj holdings that includes many of the group companies the second reason behind holdco investing are the dividends and sticking to hamara bajaj even if their auto business is going through a bad cycle maybe the group's nbfc is a lot better and can compensate for any drop in dividends in fact there's also a taxation angle to it and the introduction of section 80m in the finance act of 2020 makes retaining dividends at the holding company level a lot inefficient which has led to an increase in dividend payouts in the last 2 to 3 years and the third and perhaps the most common reason for investing via holding company is its relatively cheaper valuation as compared to the underlying investments for example the kalyani investment company limited has a bunch of shares in bf utilities hikal limited and more importantly bharat forge with the sum total of the market value of these investments coming to about 7500 crores however kalyani's market cap is only 1000 crores which gives the investor an implied discount of 87% In fact holding companies are always at a discount with this number ranging anywhere from 25% to even 90%. To understand how an investor looks at it let me simplify this Kalyani example. So let's assume one share in this holding company is priced at 100 rupees and because it is at an almost 90% discount the underlying asset which is a mix of Hikal BF utilities and Bharat Forge well this combination is available at 1000 rupees. Now these three businesses are anyways doing well and let's say we as investors expect them to grow at 26% per annum over the next 3 years which means the 1000 becomes 2000 and by that logic our 100 rupee investment should also double to 200 rupees but imagine a scenario where this discount which is currently at 90% let's say this goes down to 70% In this case what was earlier 200 rupees is now 600 which means while the underlying investment doubled over 3 years the reduction in the holding company discount prompted a 500% increase in the share price which is exactly what a holdco investor is banking on now holding companies are of two types firstly there are what we call as pure holding companies and their only objective is to invest and hold shares in other listed and unlisted companies and secondly there are operating holding companies which in addition to their investments are also running their own business operations so let's start with the first kind and the simplest of structures is where the holding company has a very small number of stocks and almost all of them belong to the same promoter group for instance kama holdings limited has a 50% stake in srf and as a pure holding company it derives all its revenue from either the dividends paid out by srf 
or by selling shares in SRF at a profit. So the company has no business of its own. It has just three employees and is completely dependent on the underlying business of SRF Limited, which is into packaging films, chemicals and technical textiles. Now, understandably, Kama Holdings, like any other Holco, also operates at a discount to the market value of its shares in SRF Limited. And it's a number that has vacillated between 50 and 80 percent over the years and is currently at about 77 percent. In my view, this increasing discount trend is purely on account of a steep jump in the share price of SRF Limited in the last 3-4 years, while Kama Holdings with its poor liquidity has not attracted similar interest, which obviously has had an impact on the share price as well. For instance, a rupee invested in Kama Holdings exactly 10 years ago would now be worth 41 rupees, which at a CAGR of 44% is incredibly good. However, if the same rupee were invested in SRF Limited, then you'd have doubled your winnings, which would now be at 83 rupees. But when we look at performance on an yearly basis, it clearly shows, at least in the case of Kama and SRF, that the holding company and the subsidiary almost never move in tandem. And that's probably where a lot of the opportunity lies because there seems to be a lag in the price movement of the underlying investment and the holding company. Let's look at another example and a rather popular one is the Tata Investment Corporation which is the prime investment vehicle for Tata Sons. Now unlike Kama Holdings which has only a handful of companies, the Tata Investment Corporation or TIC not only has shares in other Tata companies like Tata Consumer Products, Titan, Voltas, TCS, Tata Steel etc. But the company also invests in many non-Tata companies like HDFC Bank, Larson & Tubro, ITC, ICICI Bank etc and has also invested in a bunch of bonds, debt mutual funds, corporate deposits, government securities and even venture capital funds. Now I haven't done a current market value sum total of all these, but if you go with what the company's annual report is saying as a fair value of its investments, then at a market cap of 12,700 crores, the Tata Investment Corporation is operating at a holding company discount of almost 40%. But let's talk about something interesting and I'm sure you would have noticed that TIC's investment has a very familiar setup to an aggressive hybrid fund with about 70% of its assets in equities and mostly large caps while the rest of it is in debt instruments. In fact, let's take this a step further and compare TIC with ICICI Prudential's debt and equity scheme which has done really well over these last 10 years. So we start with performance and the share price of Tata Investment Corporation has certainly delivered far better returns as compared to the aggressive hybrid fund and mind you, I am yet to include dividends which is generally a 2% yield. Now on an expense ratio basis and for TIC, I think the best way of doing this is by taking the annual expenses from the PL statement which is roughly around 30 crores and dividing it by the AUM or the fair value which as of March 2023 was 20,000 crores. So 30 divided by 20,000 gives us an expense ratio of 0.15% which is far lower than the 1.13% that ICICI Prudential charges on its direct plan. I hope you are catching my drift here and the substitution of an aggressive hybrid fund with a well diversified holding company like TIC or a Bajaj holding is definitely some food for thought especially for the long term mutual fund investor. The other type of holding company are the operating ones that is holdcos that have their own operations in addition to investing in other companies which are normally group companies. For example, while Mahindra & Mahindra is a big player in tractors and automobiles, it is also the holding company for Tech Mahindra, Mahindra Holidays, Mahindra Finance, Mahindra Life Space Developers, etc. The State Bank of India is another example of a holding company with a lot of unrealized value and the same goes for HDFC Bank and the bigger players in the banking sector. But let me make a point using the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation as an example. So BBTC is an operational holding company because A, they have a 50% shareholding in Britannia Industries Limited in addition to some significant stake in Bombay Dying and National Peroxide. And on the operational part, BBTC has interest in tea plantations, coffee, healthcare, auto, electric components, etc. which are either into losses or as a business, they are not that significant. So come to think of it, BBTC is a conglomerate of sorts and using them as an example, let's look at why holding companies come at such significant discounts, which in the case of BBTC has always been between 80 and 90%. The first issue investors have is with multiple businesses in the context that valuing the true worth of the conglomerate is not easy. 
And then there is the lack of focus, which does more harm than good. And in the case of BBTC, it was getting into the airline business with Go Air, which is currently under insolvency and bankruptcy proceedings. The second issue with many holding companies is that they are very poor capital allocators. And we've already seen this with BBTC. In fact, what compounds the problem is that these decisions are not always driven by business performance. And unlike a Tata investment corporation that has a wider investing mandate, a majority of holding companies would invest their cash flows only within the group companies, even if it doesn't make any valuation sense to do that. I mean, how likely is it that a Bajaj Holdings will invest in a Hero Motor Corp or maybe pick shares in TVS Motors in a significant quantity? And the third issue that widens the holding company discount is to do with liquidation. So look at it this way. If Bajaj Holdings wants to sell off their entire stake in Bajaj Auto and Bajaj Finserve, can they sell it at 100% of the market price? Well, firstly, it's very unlikely that Bajaj Holdings is ever going to sell these shares. So that's point number one. And secondly, even if they try to do it, I'm sure the entire exercise will be super inefficient with the share price of all three companies likely to be rogered as people will only wonder what's wrong with these companies. So these are some reasons why I think the holding company discount is so large and wide. And to put this together, I've compiled here a small table of pure holding and operating holding companies, which gives us an idea of where each of these companies stand. But if you want to do this exercise in your own time, then definitely look at ITC Limited, which has interests in hotels, cigarettes, agro, paper, FMCG and IT. Also check out Godrej Industries, which is into consumer products, properties and agribusiness. Maybe Piramal Enterprises and also examine Pilani Investment and Industries, which is another pure holding company with minor stakes in Grasim Industries, Hindalco, Kesoram, Ultratech Cement and others. Now, the two most frequently used words in this video are holding and discount. And it so happens that FISDOM is holding its second Ignite event in Jaipur on the 16th of September. This all-day workshop will be an opportunity to network and learn from the best traders in the business as they share their unique trading and investing strategies with real-life case studies, future trends, and some of the tips and tricks they use to make better investing decisions. Registration for the event is now open. And if you want a discount, of course you want a discount, then do apply the code SKN60 for a 60% discount on the ticket price. All right, so I might have accidentally painted a slightly negative picture on holding companies, but from what I've seen so far, I think some things are pretty clear. For instance, when it comes to evaluating a whole co, the P ratio, the price earning multiple is absolutely irrelevant because the real valuation of a whole co is in its investments and not in its earnings. Secondly, it's very important that the underlying business of any whole co should be good and promising. And I think the perfect example of that is what the erstwhile HDFC Limited had with a stake in sound companies like HDFC Bank, the AMC Business, HDFC Life, etc. But having said this, and in my view, HDFC was surely an exception. And as a rule, if you're betting on the growth of the underlying company, then figuratively speaking, put your money on Bajaj Finance and not on Bajaj Fincer, which is the holding company. Point number three is around the management. And it's very important to evaluate their track record of capital allocation decisions, the level of dividends that they have been paying to shareholders, and also their thought process behind making growth investments. An example of this from what I saw in a video on SOIC is Tube Investments, which is a part of the Murgappa Group, which is expected to have strong corporate governance standards. And using a combination of organic growth, acquisitions, and VC infusions, they have been trying to do what Danaher has done for many decades in the US. Okay, point four is discount. And for many people watching this video, a no-brainer would be to track the holding company discount and to invest in the hold co when it goes below a certain threshold and even sell it in case the discount reduces over time. Now, in my opinion, there is nothing more arbitrary than a holding company discount because no one really knows why this number goes up and down. And therefore, there is no real formula that can help us with a buy or sell decision. But having said this, it's generally been seen that discounts narrow during a bull market and they tend to widen when the stock market is going through choppy times. And finally, in terms of opportunities, investing in a whole co is most promising when it is happening around some event or catalyst. So let me take you back in time to the year 2001 when I was a 21-year-old student attending Professor Bakshi's class on security analysis and business valuation. 
The business case given to my team was one involving TVS Suzuki, which was India's second largest motorcycle manufacturer. And in September of that year, TVS and Suzuki had announced their decision to break up. So the professor had given us a bunch of newspaper articles. And honestly, none of it was making sense until one of my teammates noticed that while TVS Motors had a then market capitalization of about 500 crores, its holding company Sundaram Clayton, which had a 54% stake in TVS, was itself available at a market cap of only 200 crores. As a 21-year-old, this was a light bulb moment because what it meant is that a company which was itself valued at 200 crores with a profitable operation had another company inside it which was valued at 270 crores. Now that you've gone through this entire video, the presence of a big holding discount is nothing to be surprised about. But in this case study, there was also a catalyst in the form of this TVS and Suzuki breakup, which led to value unlocking and in a period when the stock markets were generally flat, the share price of Sundaram Clayton tripled in a matter of six months. My point is the presence of a catalyst can remarkably change the trajectory of any stock, including the whole co. And this can take shape in the form of a merger, a demerger, a product launch, earnings report, policy changes, a change in leadership, profit guidance, etc. Perfect. So we've covered a few important things in this video. And just to recap, we looked at some reasons why an investor might or might not prefer investing via a holding company. We did a deep dive into Holco discounts and why they are so heavily discounted as compared to their underlying investments. Thirdly, we built a case for substituting an aggressive hybrid fund with shares in the Tata Investment Corporation. We then looked at some investing do's and don'ts specific to holding companies. And finally, we established the importance of a catalyst which can do wonders to the share price. I sincerely hope you found the compiled information useful and informative. And if you have any questions, then do let me know in the comments box below. Do like this video, do subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you three days from now. Until then. Thank you.